Production. This podcast could potentially have adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly the possibility of sexual content. <clears throat> Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Drinking with Authors. I'm your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is the amazing Bo Lake. And our guest today is Lyra. Oh my God, I almost said Sanchez. Sans. <laughs> it's Sanchez. fine. It's fine. I just, okay. I just got literally, I'm going to talk about my drink and why I'm drinking it, which is I'm doing a hot toddy. I added a little citrus stuff to it and things because I just got a call from somebody I was in Atlanta with who's like, oh, by the way, I tested positive for COVID. And I'm like, cool. That's, I love living in the years of COVID. That makes me so excited to not leave my house for a few days to see if I test positive. Go team. So <laughs> I'll get my craft together. I will. But what are you drinking today? I'm still not very exciting today. It's <laughs> Coke Zero, because zero sugar, and I have water in my new Bucky's mug, because Bucky's is the best gas station I've ever been to. Bucky's is like a landmark for people. Oh, Lyra, so cool. What are you drinking? I am drinking a root beer with just a splash of rum in it. I like it. Nothing fancy. Hey, I'm only slightly fancy because I added tea to my whiskey and lemon and honey concoction. And then I made one for my boyfriend because I was like, you know what, just in case. Because <laughs> I told him, I'm like, hey, so Law said I had, they have COVID. And he's like, what do you want me to do about it now? We sleep together. <laughs> Which is, by the way, his response to anything that I say when I'm sick. I'm like, do you want me to go sleep in the other room? He's like, it's already too late. It doesn't sound like that, by the way, but in my mind, he does. <laughs> so. Okay, Lyra, for anybody who doesn't know you, what do you write? Um, I am a sci-fi fantasy author with just a splash of paranormal steaminess in there. Um, my main book series right now is The Nocturne Symphony, um, which is... If you've ever wanted to see a robot do magic, this is where you could find that. Which is fantastical. So we like to Scooby-Doo in the beginning, which is go back to what made you decide to write? Um, well, I've always loved writing ever since I was a kid. I used to write little stupid stories. Um, as a teenager and before that. Um, but this story was, I actually wrote it during the COVID lockdown. <laughs> it's a quarantine baby. Um, it, I like a lot of international media and I came across something that I thought was pretty interesting. Obviously it was a slash show. And I was like, hmm, that's an interesting idea of having a character come back to life at the beginning. What could I do with that? And so I just kind of ran with it. And now we have Ren and Kaito and their misadventures, this whole weird world that I've made up with that I wish I could live in myself. There you go. And be a hardcover for the first time. Oh my gosh. It's beautiful. <laughs> I can't, I can't even are awesome aren't they like they really are something about a hardcover book it's funny because i hate reading them because they're too bulky but i absolutely love hardcover books so oh there's more coming in from the side if you're watching the YouTube. oh oh we found it we located it my wife's it. amazing wives are amazing so good but ooh, so pretty, so pretty. So, um, so you, you began and then you did a lockdown and a lot of pe people had sort of lockdown book babies, right? Some good, some bad. Um, but you actually do a tremendous amount of writing. So what is your actual first published work? It's this one, Prelude. Prelude is the very Unless first. Unless you're talking like 
archive archive of our own fan fiction mess in that case oh we do talk fan fiction oh yes oh. yes, yes. <laughs> We're going to go back. See, I knew there was something there. I could sense it. I, uh -oh. sense, it. Oh, um, I sense the tremor in the forest. The first fan fiction I ever wrote and finished that wasn't a one shot. I think I was 19 and it was a soul eater fan fiction. It's an anime where they, uh, they have these people that turn into weapons and there's a cute romance between well, not really a romance but there's a couple that everybody writes about and I did a story in which that main character is thought to have died oh wow this is an interesting the main character is thought to have died and then her friends find her with amnesia later and the whole story is about her getting her abilities back and renewing her relationship and all I'm like, wow, I have a through line of characters dying at the beginning. Of I was going to say, so this stories. was your first round of people that I love that you watch something. You're like, this is an interesting premise that I've written before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, I've done that. Hey, I like it. I like it. So um, how much fan fiction did you do? You know, there are copious amounts of yaoi slash fiction on the internet that were published under various pseudonyms that may or may not be my work <laughs> um you could find some stuff in the harry potter archives in the naruto archives um i am a huge fan of yu yu Hakusho. uh recently i was publishing in the untamed and um it shames me to say this, real people fiction. I, I won't divulge who, because I'm ashamed of it, but. <laughs> you do, do, not, do not be ashamed of any of that because, you know, it's interesting because a lot of authors cut their teeth on fan fiction, which I think is a good um, sort of gateway drug to writing your own fiction. Right. Well, first of all, you are writing your own fiction. Oh my God, nobody send me an angry email because <laughs> fan fiction people can be the nicest people and they can be the fucking meanest people. But yeah. um, no hate mail. Um, but it's interesting because when you write fan fiction, you're writing in somebody else's world and somebody else's mechanics, right? And then you have to graduate and create your own world and create your own mechanics. But it's a good way to go, how do I get to the beginning and through a story or how do I create a romance or how do I create tension and stuff like that and I think you know especially a lot of the fan fiction that I've read and that I've heard people talk about a lot of fan fiction has the characters but I don't think people realize it's completely different storylines right most fan fiction is not going, oh, we're having another day at Hogwarts. You know, when you're talking Harry Potter, it's like completely divergent, sometimes new characters blending in with the old and the stories that you want to see those characters having gone through, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, I mean, there's the, you know, sort of famous, infamous one for um, Supernatural where Dean and Castiel get together. And a lot of people have written that particular divergence which i think is amazing and brilliant and only, is the only reason castiel hanging around for any period of time actually makes sense but um and so i think it's it's amazing for authors if you want to be a writer and you want to start but you're like i don't know where to start where should i begin this is a great place to put your toe in the water to go let me let me start here let me let me start with something that i love and then i can can create something that I'd like to hear a story that I love. Uh, I pontificated for a moment, but hopefully that makes sense. I actually used to be one of those because I did usually write in the original worlds of the places that I was talking about because I always thought it was strange that people would do alternate universes because my thought was always, well, why don't you just make your own characters and make your own books? But then I actually went and started doing that real person fiction and uh which that was like okay obviously I'm not going to write about them in the real world that's boring right um so I made my own world and actually um 
that ended up being a bit of a tester precursor to um, after I finished Prelude, it helped me uh, solve some things inside of my own world. It was, I guess, the idea of taking characters that are already, someone else has already worked really hard on them. And then now it's a stepping stone to where you can take them and manipulate them and use them in your own way so you can figure out your own imaginative process. So um, that was just something that was, I recently discovered like in the last year, because I love manipulating those worlds that they exist in, but then the suddenly alternative universe fiction, what, what is this? <laughs> no, we're all about that multi-dimension, multiverse. We're in the multiverse now. <laughs> oh, you did fan fiction, didn't you? Oh, uh, I, I didn't really, I was more of an MMO RPG, like written RPG thing. That was more what I was doing. I did that as well. I, I did that as well, which is- it's I'm, glad, I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> what it, what was it called? Dragon, Dragon Realm? That was one I did. That was I did time. one called Cascade Mountains. Oh, and wow. if anyone if anyone knows about it, reach out to me because I can never find anyone who's done it before. But it well, was no. cool. I was a dragon. It was best. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so cool dragon. You your first book comes out. How many books do you have out now? Five. Okay. Five books. That's got to be exciting. So what was I, it like getting your first one in your hot little hands? I felt like I had like achieved a dream that I've always had. Like, and I, I couldn't believe it. It was actually this copy right here was the first one I received, the paperback of Prelude. And I took it out of the box and I looked at it and I was just like, can I curse on here? Is that okay? Yeah, like, yeah, you can talk, we can fucking say whatever we want to. It's an adult podcast. Holy fuck, I wrote a book <laughs> and someone liked it enough to publish it. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I still, I still look at this and I go through, I read it myself on my own and I was reading it to uh, my child who doesn't understand words quite yet so it's okay um and I'm just like I wrote that and it's not a little book either for those who can't see the YouTube it is a it's a chunky little book like it's a long book so it's almost like three books you wrote in one yeah I remember being discouraged because when I when I finished writing it, I got on Twitter. I was like, oh, let me see if I can find an agent or something. And that's when you start seeing all of the rules of fiction and how, oh, they won't publish you if it's too long. They won't publish you if it's too short. They won't publish you if it's too complicated. They won't publish you if it's this and this and this X, Y, Z. And I'm just like, okay, well, fuck traditional publishers I guess because <laughs> well I, I agree with that statement more than you can possibly imagine <laughs> as a writer too I know I'm a publisher but as a writer that is that is why I started a publishing company because traditional publishing not all now new traditional publishers because you know you have smaller to mid-range publishers that are coming up that are like no, we don't have to do it that way, but it really sucks here. You can create art, but wait a minute, we're going to put in a bunch of guardrails and you can only do it if you do it in these guardrails. And oh, wait, yeah. wait, there's not only are there guardrails, there's some bumpers and there's some rules and, and it, it gets discouraging as an artist because you go, okay, I can't create what I want to create because it doesn't fit into this little box that they want to put it in. And we need to change that fully because not everybody wants to read the stories that are in a box. But if all you publish is in a box, then that's all that's available to read. It's a very vicious catch-22. Well, then I think I read something the other day about Barnes & Noble, uh, the new CEO, who was like, no, we're not doing those deals with those traditional publishers anymore because it's all a load of bullshit. Like they're making us buy these books that are generic and people don't want to read, but we have to push them because we have a contract to push them. So I was like, I remember reading that. I was just like, that's so interesting. 
Yeah, no, the new CEO, he's basically, and I love this, and I think it's what's saving Barnes & Noble now, which is um, the people in the stores, there are people in the stores that can choose what to put in the stores based on what people, based on what people are asking for. And so you have these, be, you know, and it's sort of the age old thing where you get into a larger company and then you have these people that go do these schmoozing deals and they wine and dine people. And then, you know, I saw this in corporate America ridiculously where it wasn't the best product or a company maybe even that was starting out to do something. It was whoever came and wine and dine the person who was, you know, making the decision. And so the new CEO of Barnes & Noble went, nope, that's not how we're going to work anymore. And I think Barnes & Noble might actually make it as a bookstore because the little mom and pop bookstores do that as well. Yes, they'll get some of the, you know, you know, everybody wants a new Stephen King book. It, it'd be dumb not to stock the new Stephen King book, you know, but they also get all local authors and things like that. And people can come in and request books and get the books where when you requested books from Barnes & Noble, it got a little bit harder because they're like, oh, we don't have that. You can go order it online, which mm -hmm. should never be the fucking answer to anything. It should be like, where would you like that shipped or do you want to come in and pick it up? Here yeah. you go. Yeah. You know, but I think it is changing. Absolutely. So now you're five books in mm -hmm. since your COVID baby, which was COVID was our 2022 year. So that's a lot of writing. How much time do you spend writing? Um, I used to have a lot more time. Um, I would spend, it was my hobby. So I would be writing five or six hours a day. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm now working as a, I'm a school teacher. I won't say where, um, and I am also a new mom. My little one is about to be a year old. And I, A, can't believe that either. I feel like I blinked and now suddenly they're a father. But, uh, so I don't get as much time now. So I try to write at least, I have this, okay. So nerdy gamer in me meeting writer. I found this website <laughs> called for the words and Bo is now on this we're friends um yes and uh so you go on there and you pick a monster and you have to write the word count minimum to defeat that monster and what is this called it's called for the words so the number four and then the words um and it's it's pretty cool it's like a whole community you can even like self-promote yourself on there some people actually publish their works on there. So there's an archive that you can read what people have been writing. Um, and it's pretty cool because like there's even like a quest and things. You can make an avatar. <laughs> so wow. it's like satisfying my video gamer thing as well as my writing. And now between my work schedule and my child and just general life, I try to get at least four to 5,000 words a week. Um, and that's not always writing every day is I just write when I can um and unfortunately that slowed me down a lot uh I hate that but life happens right so well when you when you replicate yourself i.e have children <laughs> and both Bo and I can relate to this that becomes a lot more work you know because you're responsible for all the little things with the, the the mini person. And even when you get fur babies, I have a brand new fur baby. I feel like I have a toddler. She peed inside mm -hmm. the house today. I was like, oh my God, and it's a whole thing. And I'm like, now I need diapers. No, I don't need diapers. I'm not doing that. But you know, I'm like, I'm back, back to having a toddler that has to be babysat all the time. What happened? But I remember having you know, my, my little people are much older people and I have now had little people and replicated themselves, but, um, no, that's a lot of work. And even finding the time is brilliant to do any amount of, and 5,000 words a week. That's, that's awesome. That's kick ass. Now you may have done 12 times that much previously, but that's still kick ass. So, um, I will go with that. Okay. We're going to take a quick break and then I'm actually going to let Bo ask questions because I know she's thoroughly excited to do so. And I did it again where I took over the entire first half of the episode. <laughs> As someone who is also a mom and has to find weird, odd times to get some words in, 
When do you do your best writing? I don't think I've established that yet. I don't, I, it's kind of, it's a weird thing, but I will say because I, um, so I, I breastfeed. I decided to do that. That's something I knew I wanted to do when I had a baby and babies have this weird habit of falling asleep on the boob. Mm -hmm. And, um, so what, what I'll do is I'll shift my child to my chest and I'll get my computer and I will just type on there. Um, I also have this technique, I call it the pen and phone technique in which I have my stylist and my phone on the side and I will handwrite into my phone. It's, um, I'm sure my editor hates me for doing that because it makes for a lot of mistakes. Um, but, uh, that is the other thing that I do. Um, I've also recently discovered, and Bo, we were talking about this the other day, voice to text on mm -hmm. phone. And I've been trying to experiment with that. Otter. I'm driving into the work. app called Otter. If Otter? You Otter. I was actually just telling somebody about it yesterday. Is there's an app on um, called Otter, and Charles Gannon showed it to me and Val. This is what it looks like. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Oh. And it does better than Dragon Naturally Speaking, whatever. And it will upload directly to your email or to a Google Drive. Mm. What you're saying. So when you're driving, you can talk into it. If you're sitting on the toilet, you could talk into it. If you're nursing your baby, you can talk into it. And it will, it does better than any of these other even voice memos that I've seen. And there's a free one, so you can try it for free to see if it works for you. I think it allows you 600 hours for free or something ridiculous. Oh, wow. like that. Yeah, but um, I know Valerie, we know Valerie, um, who's also a co-host, wrote an entire, uh, like for six hours straight, wrote a huge chunk of a story just driving and talking. Of course, she had to edit out the road rage and um, she forgot to pause it when she ordered food. So that was fun. Um, but it's there. So you can at least take it. So when you do have time that you can actually look at the screen, you can do editing on it and cut and paste the thing. So if you suddenly think of a conversation or an action scene, you can go, this is a scene that goes into the chapter about bugbears, blah. And then, you know, because I think everything should have bugbears in it. They're horrific. Agreed. So go ahead. I Bella. feel like, yeah, I, feel like I have trouble with like the, the recording because I have like weird performance anxiety and I'll just like clam up and I won't know what to write. I I'm trying to get better at it because often I am also stuck under a baby, but it, I like the the writing it on your phone thing. That's what I do. <laughs> um let's see. What is your favorite writing snack? Chocolate and mm. ice cream with coffee. Oh, the, 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 the three worst things you can eat. That's what I always need to have beside me. Um, potato chips are okay too, but um, I like to get Dove chocolate and um, any kind of ice cream will do really, so. I love all of this and even the combination of all of these things together. I'm going to throw that out there because you can get ice cream that has chocolate covered potato chips in it. Ew. Okay. <laughs> that judgment needs to disappear. <laughs> so. I have not had that. I try and Frosties all the time. I don't want to... Oh. Now I'm going to make you try that next time I see you in person. Okay. And I okay. know exactly when that's yes. going to be. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Continue on with your questions. Where's your magnanimous list of questions? It's in, my hand. it's in my hand. Who is your favorite character in your books and why? Can I say a character that hasn't actually been published yet? Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. 
So she does the work, her working name is Lyra. Ha. Um, <laughs> she's a fairy. And um, I like her a lot because she speaks backwards. She's always mixing up metaphors. She, you know how there's that, like it's TikTok or flick flack or whatever. She mm -hmm. reverses everything. So her speech pattern to write has been so stressful, but also really fun to break all of the rules that you normally hear. Um, so as far as like favorite for like writing of a character, she's up there right now, but Ren will always have my heart. Mm -hmm. Ren Nocturne, my witch, she's, she's a badass witch with a lot of trouble and, or a lot of history and this is a character I think about her she makes me cry she makes me laugh she makes I love her sarcasm I also love that she is human and mm -hmm. she you know she falls in love with somebody and it's a forbidden romance whatever that's so cliche it's a <laughs> it's a frowned upon romance and she's just like fuck it whatever I'm here and I'm yeah Your popping bow. Oh Am I? <laughs> I'm just trying to word the question appropriately. So your books are kind of like genre genre mashing a little bit. There's some sci-fi. There's some fantasy. There's some uh, paranormal stuff. Is there a genre that you like to write but are afraid to write? <clears throat> I would say mystery, but I've already kind of written that though, because Ragtime Swing is kind of a mystery. Um, Falsetto is a horror. It might, I would never be able to pull off a Western. I'll say that I could, <laughs> I couldn't do it. I don't, even though I live in Texas, I don't think I could pull off a Western because my idea of the Wild West is not the cliche Wild West that you see in Clint Eastwood movies and stuff. My idea of the West is that very Mexican border town idea, and it's very different than what you see in mainstream Western. So I guess that would be the only genre I would be scared to touch might be an interesting challenge later down the line but um yeah everything else is just fun and interesting well, i want to see ren in uh mexico like blood meridian slash like prelude that would be cool look at you inspiring whole new books there Bo. i know well, i just throw ideas out there just bomb at them out <laughs> it's gonna be really interesting seeing how not the one I'm currently writing scherzo because scherzo is very much the metro the metropolitan area of Deus and what that looks like but so because Ren is from Deriva Deriva is very highly inspired by Mediterranean slash Mexican culture. So we're we're gonna get to see that Spanish influence once we go to Deriva, when we do that. And then also um, the other one I'm working on right now, I figured out the working title, by the way, we talked about adding this book, Bo. It's gonna be called uh, Midnight Cumbia. Ooh. And that is Atsi's love story with her, arranged wedding to Chike. So we'll we'll see how that um, more African, Afro-Cuban inspired culture meets that Mexican Latin American culture. So, yeah. Is see there an author who you admire? My favorite author, uh, is Kim Harrison. 
Um, she is the writer of the Rachel Morgan Chronicles. That was the first adult fiction book that I ever picked up. And I love it because uh, the main character's name is Rachel. She's a witch and it's the whole, her best friend is a vampire and she has a picky, pixie uh, companion. And like, it, it doesn't start as anything amazing to look at but there was a scene in I just like she's now writing like the 16th 17th and 18th books in these series like a lot of people like Jim Butcher I like Kim Harrison um mm -hmm. but there was a scene where it was Rachel she was in her back garden she was working on her witch's garden and she looked up and the cat was on the fence the pixies were in the flowers there was a gargoyle on the roof and the vampire was clucking around in the kitchen and I just will always remember that as like, I wish I lived in that world. <laughs> so that, yeah, she has my heart forever. She once, Have you commented, ever met she once commented on one of my tweets. So. Ooh. <laughs> Have you ever gone to a convention where she's been there? I've never been to a convention, period. What? We didn't get any conventions. Got to solve that problem. That's a we problem. Gotta, we got, we, yeah, we got to take her to one. I yeah, want absolutely. to go to one. Absolutely. There's one in Austin right now that's, or not right now. We'll talk after, but there's one I sent an email about that's mm -hmm. going to be in Austin that I, I would be good. I think it's going to be in Austin in September. So I know, I know Texas is a ginormous state, but I'm just saying it's in closer proximity than other things. So, uh, and I, I remember I spoke to you about this. I wanted to try to get a table at Comic-Con, but they had the, the artists tables had run out and I couldn't get a spot. So it, yeah, it's just, it's never it's, been, the stars have never aligned for me to go to a con. We will get the stars to align for you to go to a con because going to a con is awesome. And especially a lot of times, some of these authors, not all of them, but a lot of them like that tend to go to some of these conventions. So you can have the opportunity to go meet them and they are thrilled to meet you. Like you, you know, the way we are thrilled to meet our fans, they're thrilled to meet their fans. 90 eight percent of the time <laughs> every now and then you do get a dickhead author that is just not a pleasant to be around but it's the exception <clears throat> to i would say <laughs> Bo, continue do you listen to music while you write sometimes i actually will set up playlists i haven't done mm -hmm. this for scared so yet maybe i should do this I, I I used to set up playlists for whatever project I was on. It would just be a bunch of songs that would inspire me. Um, there was actually once a, not a fan fiction. This was an original work that I was working on. Every chapter title was a song title. I never finished it because sob story, the computer I had been working on it on crashed mm. and I lost a good chunk of what I had written and I just <laughs> I did the same thing so there's something I don't ever mention but I actually wrote a, a young adult fantasy book when I was a young adult two of them they were not good by any stretch so the fact that they all died horrible deaths is totally okay because one of them did start off with it was a dark stormy night so that gives you an idea of the direction they were going but I had them on one of those old Macintoshes that looked, you know, the white ones with the little teeny screen. My mom had them. We lived in Florida, got struck by lightning. They were not on a floppy disk. I lost both of them. I didn't write again for a long time because I was like, oh. and fuck the world. Like, it makes you feel hopeless. Yeah. It's just like it is but now we have the cloud. That's why, you know, people are like, oh the cloud. No, I hook everything up to the cloud. If you're listening to this podcast, hook your shit up to the cloud. Cause that way, no matter what device dies on you, whether it's your phone, whether it's your computer, whether it's your tablet, whatever the hell it is, your stuff is saved because otherwise, you know, even some of the best devices in the entire world could have a cat or a small human spill a milkshake on them and then they're destroyed. 
Correct. Yeah, Google Docs has saved my ass <clears throat> so many times. I everything I do now is online. I don't. I mean, what, eventually, what I'll do, like once or twice every other month, I'll like upload everything on Google Drive to my spare hard drive. Which actually, those files are still alive. They're in my hard drive. And they actually, once I'm done with the Nocturne Symphony, maybe I'll pull them back out and work on them. Because I really did like, it was, I think it, she was should. a ballerina and she was yeah. a witch and she was trying to fit in. It was a very steampunk, post-apocalyptic world. And she was getting revenge on an ex-boyfriend. It was great. It was going to be wonderful. And then it, it died. <laughs> yeah, no, that needs to come back. We need to bring that back. We need to resuscitate it. We need to Frankenstein it and bring it back to life. I don't think that's a real thing, how that goes, but I'm throwing it out there. <laughs> Mary Shelley made it a real thing, so. That's true. That is very true. Bella, I keep interrupting. That's that's my goal in life is to continue to interrupt your questions. But <laughs> what I'm going to your... ask the question you always hate, Erica. Okay. I'm going to ask the question you always hate. What is your best advice to other authors? Finish it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all I can say. There's no best advice. There's no best writing practices. There's only finish it. Like imagine you're in Mortal Kombat and the book is your enemy and you are about to write the last two chapters. You just have to do the KO and you have to finish it because otherwise... You can't do anything if it's not finished. This is so true. I used to play Mortal Kombat a lot. I haven't played it in a long time. <laughs> I don't know why I play it. I used to play Mortal Kombat in the arcade. I miss going to the arcade to play games. There was an exact point in time that somehow it switched from, you know, like you could go play for hours and hours to unless you were like the top of the person and waited in line and put your quarters on the thing forever, then you couldn't play. But I used to go to the arcade all the time with quarters and play and wasted a lot of money that way. <laughs> a lot of money. Where did you get the idea for Prelude? Like the setting or just in general? In general, like where, what, what, absolutely struck you that you wanted to begin this world i wanted a world where technology and magic could interact at the highest level because you never see books where i mean you see paranormal books that are set in like our technology setting where people have cell phones and maybe there's a fairy on the corner or something but you never see for, for some reason, the literary world as a unit has decided that once technology advances so far, magic can't exist anymore. And I challenge that. I challenge that because magic is the unknown. And there is never po any point in any scientific research where there will be things that we do not know and we do not understand. So, wow, that was from a very like realistic standpoint. Um, that was very profound. Very so, profound. Sorry. I'm a steampunker at heart. I think uh, technology will save the world, but I think magic will always also be a part of the world because otherwise, where will we find joy in things? That's magic true. isn't waving wands and killing people with a kill word. It's being happy. It's being joyful. It's being able to experience sadness to its fullest and... A lot of the times that's missing in the most advanced sci-fi. You get so caught up in this is the end all be all of science. We're about to have an alien invasion or we have to defeat this foreign robotic menace and humans are forgotten in science fiction. So if that's that- very true. Obviously, that's not true of all sci-fi authors. Obviously, the greatest sci-fi authors do a best, the great job of having the humanization. So, well, and I think it, it to your point, it's again the boxes. Like here we go, traveling me and my whiskey, traveling back to the beginning and talking about 
forcing into boxes. I think that's why some of these stories, like you said, are not as told and are now coming out and being told because no, if you're going to write sci-fi, it has to be hard sci-fi and, you know, science and people want aliens that are rigid. And, you know, what do you, what do you mean fairies? There can't be any fairies here with this spaceship. Like, what is that bullshit? You know, that's, I think it's back to what you said before, where we don't have to be stuck in those genres anymore and we can make whatever genres we want to make every year whole new codes are put out to 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 make way i mean like 10 years ago there was no such thing as a paranormal romance code bisect code you know how you tell genres that didn't exist it mm -hmm. wasn't a thing and now there's like mutations of paranormal the vampire romance and werewolf romance and like because people are like nah i'm gonna write this anyway and there's enough of it that they have to go oh there's enough of this and and it's by um independent publishers and self-publishers and stuff going self-published people going yeah that's cute we appreciate it but we need this other code we're gonna need this code because it's a thing to do it i mean last year alone there was 163 bicep codes or something like that added so i think your magic is populating the world see how i did that bob slid that right in there. I, I did that, that was so good <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just speechless for a second. I was like, whoa. Erica, I'm on it today. Pontificating <laughs> from my guest room with my hot daddy. <laughs> it is weird seeing you in a different room, Erica. I don't know. I don't know if I like it. Well, it's, see, it's so strange. I'm so used to the other one. Well, it's funny because if you came to my house, one of the reasons we got this house because we moved to North Carolina was um, my boyfriend's office is in the exact opposite corner. Like his is upstairs on the other side of the kitchen and my office is downstairs, whatever. But we used to game together all the time. And so he's like, you know what? I miss gaming with you. So my work computer can be up there, but I'm gonna move my gaming computer back into the office. So we're together. This sounded great. You know, it was one of those moments of like, oh, yay. And then I realized so when he games, he games online with people. It's not a solitary event, which I think most of us mm -hmm. game online to some degree. Like some games you play by yourself, but a lot you have other people. Well, he is like one of those game talkers too. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in the room with him, I hear, wait, no, wait, wait, are we going back to the base? And so I'm in the middle of a podcast and you're hearing like, no, no, what's, what's happening? You know? It sounds like some weird adventure is going on behind me. And I'm like, so tell me about your political set here. And he's like, shoot the org. And it's never like, it's never like shoot the org. It's always like over the top screaming from the other side. And it's so funny because one time I was like, can you just, can you just keep it to a dull roar? Like put on your headset. It It's about an hour and a half, just, you know whatever and this is what i was hearing no no shoot the fucking thing no just shoot it no why, why did we all just die what were you doing and i'm like but it's like what, you're like, you're what were you doing and i'm like you're, you're not you're not actually being quiet and he's like what i can't hear you <laughs> i'm like okay so i'm gonna i'm just gonna when he's playing i'm just gonna move to the guest room so this is my this is my guest room there <laughs> So that you're not hearing him yell about orcs or whatever. I, I don't know. I think he's playing Destiny right now. Who the hell knows? Depending on the game, you get different responses. I think that's true for all of us, depending on the game. True. So, yes. Now that I've talked about my weird room, Bo. <laughs> Bo. What, uh, I'm going to ask the question. <laughs> what is your favorite and least favorite book trope? Oh God. Uh, tropes. We're gonna talk about tropes. Um oh yeah. Maybe my least favorite, because I know that off the top of my head. I hate um love triangles. I can't stand love triangles unless there is a caveat, unless there there is a chance that all three of them will end up together. I, I, I didn't. Or if there, so long as there's a chance that like also 
because so the love triangles are usually like this like there's a person a person and then this person in the middle needs to choose there needs to be this okay there needs to be a chance that this person if they don't make their decision the other two will get together and leave them out which means there needs to be a chance of bisexuality or homo, homo homosexuality somewhere in there so that's unless they're all you know whatever but so that's my least favorite trope my favorite trope <clears throat> I might have to start listing them. I keep thinking of like friends to lovers or enemies to lovers. I guess I have to say enemies to lovers just because that's the first thing that's coming to my mind. And that is also... I, I always put the bad guy with the good guy, you know. I'm a fan of Loki. I like I like the idea of him with, you know, some of the heroes sometimes. Heroines, heroes, whatever. But oh, I don't like it. I don't like it. Okay. I'm gonna ask the final question. You see how I just did that, Bo? I'm gonna ask the final thought, question. Yeah. Who would you ask? is in prelude is the two lead characters who would i cast yep you're making a movie who would you cast um there is a very handsome very eloquent chinese actor um who i would cast as kaito uh, his name is shao san or shan sao however you want to think about it so he he's gorgeous he's tall and beautiful and he was actually like one of like Forbes top 10 most attractive men in the world for a few years he's still on that list he was the most beautiful man in China but anyway um but for Ren It would have to be an actress of mixed heritage because Ren is of mixed heritage. Um, I was actually seeing, what's the name of the actress that, she's the main actress in The Witch and then she was also the Queen's Gambit. Do you know who I'm talking about? She, yeah. Um, I can't remember her name, but she might be a contender. Um, I was imagining Zoe Deschanel for a while as Ren. Um, it was Anya Taylor Joy. That one, yeah. So she. I found out that she's of mixed Hispanic heritage, and I was like, okay, well, dye her hair black and give it a curly look, and she might work as Ren, um, the hard thing about Ren is it needs to be an actress who can sing, dance, and play a role because that's Ren is a singer and a dancer. So it's it would be super hard. I don't know. It's okay. We just need to go to Broadway and find some Broadway stars. Yes, absolutely. Oh my gosh, she's too old to play Ren now. But there was an actress. I absolutely loved her. She was um, wicked for a long time. She was Lucy in Dr. Jack and Mr. Hyde. Uh, I, I need to go. Is Ida Mandel? I'm not saying it correctly. I Like she was um, witch. And then she was on Glee. And John Travolta completely butchered her name way worse than I just did on the um, Golden Gloves. I think, or Oscar. She played um, uh, Elsa in Frozen. Is that her? Oh, yeah, I know. It's not her, uh, oh. though I know she did do those roles. I'm, I'm Googling her now. I wonder if I can find it. She was, let's see. Um, I like how we Google. I love yeah. us. <laughs> we're like, you know, we're in the middle of... We're going to Google it. I Google things all the time on this show. I'm like, wait, what the hell is the name of that? We're word? like, hold on, people listening. Give us a minute. Give us a minute. 
We need to, we're going to tell you some new stuff. We should put in like music that's like, da, na, 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 while we're typing, and then we'll be like, we're back. I would, but my producer would kill me. He's like, <laughs> we already have commercials. Shut up. <laughs> Pauline Sexton. Okay. She, here's a picture of her and Dr. Jacqueline Hyde. I don't know if I can put it in chat, but. Go for it. I remember I, okay, this was the woman that made me realize I was bisexual. Okay, I'm going to be, <laughs> not going to lie. Um, she's just absolutely gorgeous. She has a gorgeous voice and she can move on top of that. But uh, like I said, she'd be too old now to, pay, to play the role of Ren. No, well, we can find her equivalent. I'm sure that exists. Um, okay, so to wrap up, my friend, because we have to wrap up, uh, shameless self-promotion time. Talk about how people can find you, you to follow you on social media and your books as we look uh, at the picture. Okay, um, I am, um, the name of my website is bookwitchsigns.com. Um, you can find all of the latest about what I'm working on there. Um, all of my books are available for purchase on Kindle audio, or almost all of them on audiobook on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Google Play, anywhere you can think of. Um, I tend to haunt the edges of TikTok every so often. Uh, you want to see a cute baby, you'll see that on my um, profile there. And then my, all of my handles are bookwitch underscore signs for pretty much everything. And um, I'm not great with social media, but I do post from time to time. And yeah, that's, sorry, you told me to, ju you just told me to do the worst thing. No, <laughs> no I am perfect. I cannot great. tell myself. I'm not no. good. <laughs> Don't worry. We will post it in the show notes as well so people can find you can thank you so shove it in people's faces and you can go, here, go do that and go read it and if you don't like it tell me all about it because bad reviews make books sell too <laughs> that is so true that is i so really true. want i really want to send prelude to one of those big mega churches and have the pastor read it just so that the Christian community or like that community of people can start burning it. Oh, you say that, but talk to Danielle Arsino about how that goes. Her previous publisher put her book in Christian fiction. And it, and is not. it, is, it did not go. <laughs> no. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want it to be in Christian fiction. I want them to read it, decide this is a 50 shades of gray that needs to be destroyed. And I want them to burn it. So that they can buy it to burn it in mass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then other people will buy it because it'll be banned and, and then we'll sell like hotcakes. Because then it'll be on the burned books list. And clearly that's something people need to read. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. Very cool. Okay, guys, this has been Drinking with Authors. Um, I've been your host, Erica Lance. My amazing co host has been Bo Lake. And don't forget to like, subscribe, review, leave comments, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.